Good morning, Wheaton College. Morning. It's a, a pleasure, an honor, uh, it's humbling, a little scary uh, to be with you this morning. So I'm, I'm so pleased to worship with you. It's a new year. Uh, at Calvin College, we haven't even started yet. It's a new place for some of you. For, for some, this is the beginning of a whole new season of life, and others of us are getting to know new people, building new friendships. And when you want to get to know somebody, you, you sort of probe them with different questions. What are your interests? Where have you been? Where are you from? If you really want to know what makes somebody tick, if you really wanted to ask a question that was incisive, and sort of penetrated to the heart of who they are and really define them as a person. The question that you really want to ask them is, what do you want? What do you long for? What are your hungers? What are your cravings? What are your loves? What do you love? Because, friends, this morning I want to suggest that we are made to be lovers that Christ has created us in his image to be first and foremost people who are made to love and worship God. You are what you love. But this morning I want to contemplate and pause over a little bit of a discomforting reality that comes with that. You might not love what you think. You are what you love, but you might not love what you think. This sort of discomforting epiphany hit home for me when I was uh, watching a film by a Russian filmmaker named Andrei Tark Tarkovsky. I, I need to get better hobbies, I realize. Um, but Tarkovsky has this 1979 film called The Stalker. This is not, sorry, this is not Hollywood blockbuster stuff, but the plot is really, really easy to get a handle on. There are three key characters in this story. The writer, the professor, and the stalker or the guide. It's, kind of, it's actually, now that I think of it, it's like the perfect liberal arts movie in a way, right? You've got the writer, you've got the professor, and then you've got this guide who is leading them. And here's the scene. You have to picture a world that's kind of a mix of Cormac McCarthy's The Road and the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. So it's kind of this post-apocalyptic environment with slight shades of this kind of fantastic fantasy world of enchantment. And here's what drives the narrative. The stalker, the guide, is leading professor and writer through this post-apocalyptic region to try to get to an area called the zone, which is this enchanted space within this world. And then within the zone, they make their way carefully and, and, and prudently to reach a particular sort of sanctuary within the zone that's simply called the room. So it's a little bit like, a, you can think of it as a sort of quest narrative. There's a bit of a Tolkien-esque kind of endeavor, a pilgrimage here. And writer and professor are leashing themselves to stalker, the guide, because he's the one who's going to take them to the room. Why? What's in the room? The room is what has drawn them there, because in the room, he tells them, you will achieve your heart's desire. The room is this enchanted sort of magical space where all your dreams come true. When you walk into the room, you get exactly what you want. Jeffrey Dyer, who's uh, one of our greatest literary critics today, I think, and also a novelist himself, has written this amazing little book about this movie called Zona. And here's, here's his redescription of the scene to capture it. They are in this big, abandoned, derelict, dark, damp room with what looked like the remains of an enormous chemistry set floating in the puddle in the middle, as if the zone resulted from some ill-conceived experiment that went horribly wrong. Off to the right through a large hole in the wall is a source of light that they all look towards. For a while, no one speaks. The air is full of the chirpy, chirpy, cheep, cheep of birdsong. It's the opposite of those other places where the sedge has withered from the lake and no birds sing. The birds are whistling and chirping and singing like mad. And Stalker tells writer and professor, tells us in a sense, that we are now on the very threshold of the room. This is the most important moment in your life, he says. Your innermost wish will be made true here. 
So, here we are. We're on the threshold of the room. Here's where you can have what you want. Who wants to go first? Both writer and professor get cold feet. They don't want to be the first one to walk into this room. What? Why? This is, this is where your dreams will come true. This is where everything you want will be realized. This is why we made this arduous journey. Why don't you want to step into the room? Because it has dawned on them. What if I don't know what I want? <laughs> what if I don't know what I want? Well, as Dyer puts it, that's for the room to decide. The room is going to reveal all. What you get is not what you think you wish for, but what you most deeply wish for. And so this disturbing epiphany starts creeping up on professor and writer. What if they don't want what they think? Put it this way. What if the desires of their hearts that they feel like they are conscious of the ones that they've chosen are in fact not their innermost longings, their deepest wish. What if in some sense their deepest longings that are rumbling around in their consciousness, humming their unawares, what if in fact those are something other than what they think? Now, I think many of us should be able to identify this. If I ask you as Christians, what do you love? What do you want? What do you ultimately desire? Here's the thing. You know the right answer to that question. You absolutely know the right answer to that question. You know what you ought to say. In fact, you might be, and your statement would be entirely genuine and authentic. If I ask you, what do you want? What do you love? What do you long for? You will tell me the answer that you believe. But here's the question. Do you want to step into that room that gives you your innermost longings? This, as Dyer concludes, says, is one of the lessons of the zone. Sometimes a man doesn't want to do what a man thinks he wants to do. Now, thanks be to God, Christian worship faces this reality head on. It names it, it faces it, it owns up to it. It recognizes this gap that we experience between what we know and believe and think and what we love and hunger and crave. And it faces it heads on. It's why the people of God are regularly called to confess their sins. In fact, listen to this historic confession from the Book of Common Prayer, which names this tension this way. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. See, what, what you kind of come face to face with in the plot of this film is that the devices and desires of our own hearts sometimes elude our conscious awareness and best thinking. And what what the adventure of the Christian life, the adventure of sanctification looks like is trying to sort of close that gap between the two. And the body of Christ is that unique community of practice that owns up to this fact that we don't always love what we say we do. That the devices and desires of our own hearts often outstrip our best intentions. In fact, the practices of Christian worship that also the Wheaton Chapel program is inviting you into are precisely a tangible, practiced, reformative way to address this tension and gap. You see, what's interesting is in, in the scriptures and in the history of the Christian tradition, love, to say that you are what you love, in the history of the Christian uh, tradition, virtue theory and so on, love is understood to be a habit. Love, your loves are habits. And that means that your love is kind of like second nature. It directs us, it propels us, but it's often operating under the radar of our conscious awareness. It's like breathing and blinking, right? First nature is what you do when you're breathing and blinking. So you're all sitting here breathing right now, and you didn't have to think about that. I mean, you're thinking about it now, but you weren't, right? You weren't sitting here saying, 
breathe, breathe, right? Why? Because it's humming along by the sort of governed by nature and is working without you having to deliberately choose it. Well, when, when we talk about love as a virtue, when we talk about love as a habit, we're saying that loves become a kind of second nature that are also humming along and guiding you and governing you and aiming you in certain directions without your realizing it. It, means, it also means, by the way, that our loves acquire direction and orientation. What I'm aimed at, what I'm pursuing, what I hunger for, because over time, we become immersed in practices and rituals that are forming and shaping and training my heart in certain ways. Th think of it this way. Your loves are more caught than taught. Your loves are recruited by practices and rhythms and rituals that you give yourself over to. And I want to I sort of reclaim an old word to name those love shaping practices, I'm gonna call them liturgies. Liturgies are the kinds of love shaping, heart directing practices and habits and rhythms that shape you in ways that, now here's the important part, you might not be realizing. So not only are our habits unconscious and operating sort of under the hood, so to speak, but it also means that the very process by which you are acquiring that orientation, that disposition, those hungers, is also unconscious and often covert. And this is especially the case when we don't recognize cultural practices and rhythms as the liturgies that they are. When we imagine that they're just benign cultural things that we do, and we don't realize that they are doing something to us. So consider the implications of this for the fact that you are lovers, that you are made to love God and love what God loves. If you think of love-shaping practices as liturgies, right, what you love is in a way what you worship, what you ascribe worth to, what you think is ultimate, what you want to enjoy. If love-shaping practices are liturgies, what that also means is you could be worshiping other gods without even realizing it. You wouldn't even be aware in some ways of all the ways that your heart has been captivated by rival gospels. That's because the kinds of cultural liturgies I'm talking about aren't just one-off events that you do. They are more specifically formative practices that are doing something to you. They, they are, you could say, sometimes we don't even realize all the ways that our hearts are being taught to sing the songs of Babylon rather than the songs of Zion. And sometimes that's because we are actually overly concerned about the messages and ideas in culture, and we miss all of the liturgies of culture that are recruiting us to a rival story. Some cultural practices, then, are training your loves in ways that you might not be aware of. That's why you might not love what you think. This isn't because some message has changed your mind. It's not because you've been hoodwinked by a bad idea. It's because a rival liturgy has captured your heart. Let, let me give you um, uh, one, one example. It's in your pocket. So this, this epiphany for me, so I watch... I don't want you to think I only watch Russian films and beer commercials, but however, I've had two huge epiphanies watching Russian films and a beer commercial. This, the, uh, sadly, th this is really bad to talk about at Wheaton College. I don't know, I'm all of a sudden I'm really nervous that the president <laughs> is sitting here. It, it just happens, That's not, I went, didn't go looking for it, I was just watching television, this beer commercial comes on. Sadly, it was a Michelob Ultra commercial. Friends, if you ever backslide, please don't do it with Michelob Ultra. Uh, um, so here's, here's what's fascinating. Um, as you know, some of our most brilliant creative minds in our culture work in marketing, right? This is why you have to watch carefully. Here's what happens in this beer commercial. Now, remember, it's a beer commercial, so almost de facto, it is horribly sexist, right? So I'm just, I'm just naming that from the beginning. It's the end of a workday. 
four bros, basically, come walking out of the office, right? It's the end of the day. They need to blow off some steam. So they walk out of their office building, come up to the curb. It's time for this guy to carpool home. They come to his car. They meet his car at the curb. It's a, it's a terrible car. It's like a totally lame car. Who wants to drive this car? Nobody wants to drive that car. So what do they do? Magically, the car of their dreams, a Jaguar F-Type sitting there, and they get in, and they're off. Magically cut to a different scene. They're at the beach. Remember, I told you this is a fantasy world. It's a beer commercial. They're at the beach. Off in the distance are some young ladies that they think maybe they are interested in. They might be interested in them, but they're not sure. It's a long ways off, so what do they do? Oh, all of a sudden, these young women are right there talking to them, and of course, they're interested in them because they're drinking Michelob Ultra, which is the magic, so on and so forth. Cut scene again, we're in the club, up on the stage is the DJ, there's something playing that they really don't want to listen to, it's really lame music, who wants to be bored by that? And so what do they do? All of a sudden, everything they want is on stage, on their terms, and they get to listen to it. And I, I'm watching this, and I realize this is a philosophical analysis of culture. Why? Because of course, these little ritual moves are the moves uh, that we make when we caress our iPhones, right? Steve Jobs was a master of desire. And he knew the power of the affect of touch. And so what you start to realize is, okay, what's going on in the story of this 30 minute, this is a 30 second slot, right? What's going on is you realize that these gentlemen who have been living their lives with this little micro liturgy of how they interact with the phone, it's actually trained them to relate to the entire world in that way. How? What's going on? Well, the little micro-liturgy of interacting with this is by, by tapping, touching, swiping, caressing, whatever, however we want to put it, it, this little machine is an egoism engine. It subtly and covertly and tacitly but powerfully has co-opted me into a vision of the world and a view of the good life which has taught me I should never be bored. I should never be not the center of attention. I should never be dissatisfied with anything. The entire world should be available to me on my terms, when I want it, on, on the terms in which I set it, and everything should be available to me as the center of the universe. In other words, I don't care, notice, we haven't said a word about the content of what you're looking at on your phone. You could be, in a sense, you could be reading the Gospel Coalition website all day long, but the thing is, the way we interact, I'm talking about the form of the practice by which I interact with the, the little liturgy that comes with my interaction with this device effectively keeps making me the center of the world. And so you end up practicing an egocentric understanding of the cosmos rather than a theocentric orientation to the God who has made the cosmos. And it's not because I necessarily received bad ideas from this little device. It's because it has co-opted me into a liturgy, a ritual, a set of rhythms and practices that have covertly and tacitly taught me to love me, myself. So what I want us to start to realize, and, and we could expand this now to c consider this like a kind of cultural exegesis of secular liturgies, right? Reading the practices that we are immersed in. So what do we do <laughs> with this reality? How can we counter this deformation of our loves by rival liturgies and rival cultural practices. Well, remember, it's going to require rehabituation. If love is a habit, and I've learned to love in all of these covert, performed, enacted, liturgical ways, what I need in my life are better liturgies rival kingdom-oriented liturgies that are not just retraining my intellect, but are captivating my heart and my imagination. So I want to suggest two sort of moves to make if you start to sort of analyze culture in this way. The first is simply this. 
The beginning of wisdom is to become aware of the everyday liturgies in your life. Take a liturgical audit of your life. And what I mean by that is try to step back and do some self-examination to ask yourself, what are the rhythms and rituals and practices that you give yourself over to? Imagine this as a kind of liturgical examine in which you pause for reflection on the rituals and rhythms of your life. This could even be a focus of an annual retreat, a sort of weekly quiet time, an evening sort of compline, uh, uh, reflective time. But the question you want to ask yourself is, what are the things you do that do something to you? What are the things that you do that when you look at them through this lens, you realize they're doing something to you? What are the quote unquote secular liturgies in your life? What story about human flourishing is carried in those cultural practices? What kind of person do they want you to become? To what kingdom, in a sense, are those rituals aimed? And what does that cultural institution want you to love? What are you giving yourself over to? Now, when you start to kind of analyze your cultural immersion through that lens, you start to see things differently. We, we could run an analysis of the mall as a cathedral of consumerism. We could run an analysis of the stadium as a cathedral of nationalism. Just ask Colin Kaepernick. Don't challenge the gods. So you begin to appreciate that what's at stake in this ubiquitous feature of our cultural landscape that never ever garnered your attention before. My hope is you get new eyes for looking at the everyday that you give yourself over to. And you might start to get worried. That's okay. <laughs> That's not a bad place to be because now here's the very, very important pivot. None of this is a surprise to the God who made us. God knows that we are creatures of habit. God knows that we are lovers. And so what God gives us is the gift of precisely reorienting practices, renewing liturgies, rehabituating our hungers for him and for his kingdom. So waking up, in a sense, to the formative power of secular liturgies might open us up now to appreciate the importance of Christian liturgies in our lives, which again, also aren't just something that you do. They are a space in which the Spirit is doing something to you. This is why worship is the heart of discipleship, and why the church is a gymnasium, you might say, where Christ trains our hearts. The Spirit recreates us to be the image bearers that we were made to be, as we heard in Genesis 1 this morning. It, it is the space in which we are rehabituated to be able to bear God's image to the world and for the world, to love and worship the one that we are made for. I'm, I'm so happy to be a gateway drug to St. Augustine. This is, that's like the kindest compliment anyone has ever given me. <laughs> so I have to close with St. Augustine. In one of St. Augustine's sermons on the Psalms, there is a stunning passage in which he meditates on the crucifixion and sees it pointing towards the church. It comes in the context of describing the church as a hospital. That the body of Christ extends the healing work of the risen, ascended Christ. St. Augustine emphasized what he called the totus Christus, the whole Christ. And that if Christ is the head of the body, then the body is Christ too. And he says this, Adam was a type of Christ God sent a deep sleep upon Adam in order to fashion a wife for him from his side. In Christ's case, a bride was made for him as he slept on the cross and made from his side. With a lance to his side was struck, uh, with a lance, his side was struck as he hung there and out flowed the sacraments of the church. Friends, 
God knows that we need the hospital that is Jesus. Salvation, you might say, is surgery. In salvation, you get a heart transplant. But after you get a transplant, you need all kinds of post-operative care. We need to be protected from infection. We need to exercise. We need therapy. We need to change our eating habits. We basically need to learn to live with new hearts. The church is the post-operative care center for people with new hearts. Sanctification, then, is that adventure, that rehabilitation. And the church is the place where Christ's healing power flows. Amen.